Patrick Ryan of the Tennessee World Affairs Council here on behalf of the Japan American Society of Tennessee. And we're talking today with uh, John Gregory. Uh, he worked uh, at the Tennessee Economic and Commun Community Development uh, uh, Department in the state of Tennessee. And uh, he was the director of Asian Development. I worked there from 1977 to 2006. And we're talking today about the impact of Japanese business on the state of Tennessee. Welcome, John. Thanks for taking time. Well, thank you for having me. Let's, uh, let's start out with a little bit of your background so we can uh, understand how you came to be in the, the position of uh, working with uh, Japanese companies and uh, developing uh, business relationships uh, in the state of Tennessee. What, uh, what brought you uh, along from uh, your education at uh, uh, MTSU and uh, your service in the Army? Tell us a little bit about your background. Well, I was I was in Vietnam, um, 1968 through 69, and part of that experience included being hospitalized in uh, Japan. And I was there for about a month, and I really enjoyed. I've always had a very strong attraction for the Asian uh, culture. And I enjoyed my experience in Vietnam and in, in Japan. I love the people. And, and when I left uh, Tokyo, I remember thinking to myself, I'll never be back here again and regretting that. And just goes to show you need to be careful what you pray for because <laughs> it's a total life career. Uh, I went to work with economic development in 1977 primarily in our existing industry services um, section. And my job was to develop um, the programs that the state could administer to help uh, existing industries, identify what their needs were and how we could better suit what government brought to the table there. So that's where I was working when I was asked to, when I was first asked to work uh, as kind of a sidekick to, with some friends there at the department to help with some of the new uh, Asian companies that were looking at Tennessee. And the first one I worked with was Toshiba, uh, which was the first manufacturing development ever uh, to land in Tennessee. And they bought property just south of Nashville uh, in Lebanon. And uh, that was a fairly good sized deal. And then uh, Lamar Alexander uh, became governor. I originally started with Ray Blanton um, and Lamar Alexander became governor. And under Lamar's administration, he began to focus more and more on Japanese investment, uh, particularly because of one of the first projects that came under his administration was the Nissan Corporation. And I started working with the Nissan people before I knew what Nissan was. So um, anyway, I, I began working with those people and I was enjoying it very much. And I got along with the Japanese. And so when they put together an incentive package, one of the incentives was me offered up as uh, the the uh, Nissan coordinator for the state of Tennessee. And my primary job was to make sure that their location went as smoothly as possible and to make sure that all the promises, the economic promises and the other promises uh, of uh, services, et cetera, made by local communities and other state government agencies were um, brought to bear in a timely manner uh, to make sure that they uh, would start their uh, start up on time. So that's where I found myself. And uh, with Nissan became all of their constituents, their suppliers, et cetera. And pretty soon I was not only working on things that had to do with Nissan, but Nissan would ask me to help th their supplier find a, a suitable manufacturing assembly uh, properties nearby so they could uh, serve the new uh, Nissan community. So I think um, Governor Alexander uh, had a very clear vision that this was going to turn into a fairly big deal. And uh, 
slowly but surely it, it did. And I was, I was fortunate enough to be there for the first manufacturing uh, facility. Um, now, uh, I, John, John yeah. uh, Governor Alexander, he was 79 to 87, is that right? Right. In, in that, that, that window there. And uh, uh, I, I think uh, you went with him to uh, Japan and had some observations about how he uh, was astute to uh, see the, uh, the potential. Oh, yeah, very much so. Um, I was going to say when, when he first came there, there was only, uh, I think, about eight Japanese companies in Tennessee. And, uh, and of course, Nissan presented, you know, uh, an opportunity for around 2000 initially. So that was that was a big deal. And uh, Governor Alexander put his his time where his mouth was saying it was priority and started making trips to Japan to actually try to market the state of Tennessee there. And when he was not there, then I would go with some of my other constituents in marketing and try to lay groundwork work for future trips and identify other companies that needed to be cultivated. So that's kind of when the ball started, the snowball started rolling downhill. Um, yeah, we, uh, had, we had joined, the state of Tennessee had joined the Southeast U.S. Japan Association, uh, which was a conglomeration. Of, it was an organization of seven states and, on one side and an organization of Japanese businessmen on the other. And we would have meetings on alternate years, either in one of the states, in, in uh, in the United States or go to Japan and have a meeting there, either in, in Nagoya or Tokyo or, or Osaka. So that presented a really good opportunity for the governors to show their interest by actually showing up at those meetings. A lot of the seven states governors didn't particularly feel like that they could give their time to that, but Alexander went to each one of them. And I think McWhorter went to just about all of them except for maybe one that it was, he, he came in for like one night of it and couldn't spend the rest of the time. And, uh, and Don Sunquist did the same. He was very committed to carrying on that organization because it gave them opportunities to talk to the business community in Japan and let them know that not only were they talking about how much they wanted them there, but they were actually showing up and putting their, uh, you know, their money where their mouth is, as it were. By now, I've, heard, I've heard that Governor Alexander had a map that he would take with him to, J to Japan that showed Tennessee and uh, the proximity of Tennessee to all of the markets around the United States all of the uh, logistics uh, hubs and roads and trains, et cetera? Well, our, our, uh, our director of communications at that time, Bill Boozer, and strangely enough, he didn't drink. Um, <laughs> he, he called it the night that the lights were on. Alexander had this wonderful picture of the United States that had lights focused on the major uh, the major population areas. And it kind of showed that most of the population, there was two main markets. There was the Eastern seaboard and the Western seaboard around California. In the Eastern seaboard, Tennessee was right dead center. So he would use that as a, a marketing tool to, to show people that they could market to the major markets, most of the major markets in the United States that they had a facility in, in, in Tennessee. Um, we also started keeping track of, and that's again, one of the reasons I was lucky to be there from day one, was we, I started keeping track of where the different companies were landing in Tennessee. So we had not only the the night map that shows when the lights were on, but we had a map of the state of Tennessee, which showed where all the companies were. And 
Japan, you know, the Japanese are very caste oriented kind of things in terms of their culture, but particularly in business, you know, they have different groups, the Nissan group, the Toyota group, the Sumitomo group, the Toshiba group, they all have their own little fiefdoms there. And all of them were interested in, every time I would go call on a Japanese company and pull out the map of Tennessee, they would pour over it wanting to know, oh, so many people and da 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 da, da on and on and on. It was, um, it was kind of like old home week. Um, and as we got to know these people, you know, I think Alexander was very astute when he realized, you know, all these guys went to school together. And they went to the same schools and they've kind of grown up, you know, along the same line so they could tell him who was next up and, and this and the other. So he started uh, cultivating the, the people that were coming up in the ranks as well. So anyway, it was, it, he developed a lot of good marketing practices, I guess that's what I'm saying. Okay, so what was the, uh, the expansion from eight companies to uh... Uh, many more under Governor Alexander and then uh, McWhorter. What, what was the atmosphere like around Tennessee as these companies were coming in? Well, in, initially, I think the, the atmosphere was very comprehensive. Um, when Nissan landed, uh, I was surprised in the state of Tennessee that people referred to them, often referred to them as Chinese. I mean, it was like there was Asians and everybody in Asia was Chinese. And we didn't, you know, we didn't start realize some of the communities didn't realize that there was distinct different countries and nationalities. I mean, we were pretty green. And the other thing that was concerned was a lot of people thought in terms of Chinese is they brought over all the Chinese to do the railroads and so there weren't jobs for the you know regular people here and right. having to having to educate the community that the japanese are only going to bring a few core executives to get the place started up and they would hire they were very good about hiring locally in trying to get their personnel managers the core group of people that were in the plant managers trying to hire their, their core group of executives from the local community. So they ended up being very good corporate citizens, but initially people were afraid that they were going to bring all the employees with them and end up taking all these tax advantages and not giving you know people anything in return. So I was on the, the, the fried chicken circuit for all the Rotary clubs and everything for a good deal of my first year as Nissan coordinator for the state of Tennessee, uh, trying to answer questions about what's actually happening, how many local hires there would be, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, doing that not only for Nissan, but for other, uh, other companies that were the Nissan supplier, they were going to other parts of, the, of Tennessee. So. Okay, so and that was, in, that was uh, around yeah. 1980? That was around 1980, and um, I had um, I had to go back. I retired in 2006, but I I was looking at uh, remarks from uh, Commissioner Kisber in the year that I retired, which I probably wrote because I told you. But he uh, he was citing that you know from those initial eight Japanese companies in 1976 uh, in in the last, in that 30 year period, about 168 Japanese companies were in Tennessee employing over 42,000 people and investing over $12 billion. So what happened was Tennessee being an afterthought in this whole scheme of marketing had ended up being one of the major Japanese investment hubs in the whole United States. Um, and we're very proud of that. I think also toward the end of my tenure with economic development, I think the attitude had already changed from apprehension at strangers coming to seeing a Japanese investment in one's community 
becoming a star in their crown. It was kind of like a stamp of approval. The Japanese were noted for asking a million questions, you know, no stone left unturned. And if a car, if a, a, a city or municipality could attract someone that, that was that particular about making sure their investment worked, they could use that as a sales tool for attracting other investors. It was kind of proof that they were worthy as it were. Yeah, we've got the uh, the current example of uh, the magnet, the magnetism. You're stuck. Are you there, John? Hello, John. Hello, John. John, John, John. Bill, make a note, uh, John, John Gregory. We're going to need to. Reconnect the uh, piece here. Now I, I still see recording. The red dot is uh, looks like it's working, so I'm assuming the problem is it is in. Well, he's gone now. Uh, where are we on the recording? The time here. No, I, I'm I'm going to let it roll. I'm trying to figure out where a time hack. Okay, it's uh, time is one fifty three, and I think we started recording about one thirty. Unknown caller. Hi, John. Yeah, uh, go ahead and log in, uh, please. Uh, uh, I'm, okay, I'm, okay, I'm going to leave and then log back in. All right, great. Thank you. Yeah, when you see the frames, you'll see me uh, sitting here by myself holding my chin. Uh, he he got dumped on his end. Yeah. Uh, I'm not. I had a turkey thing. Or chicken. There's more in there, chicken and stuff. Hi, John. Can you hear me? Okay. We're back. All right. Well, you had just finished uh, comments about the gold star effect in the community, and okay. you paused. Uh, so, where we got cut off was a good break, and I was going to uh, respond to that. So, I'll I'll just uh, Please. jump in. I'll just jump in now. Okay. Um, and so uh, we've got an example of that magnetic effect of businesses, uh, the large corporations coming in. And uh, I think uh, you had mentioned that Japanese suppliers were attracted uh, from Japan to come over if they had been connected with the Nissan group or other, other groups. Uh, but there's also the effect that we've seen uh, Bridgestone move their headquarters to downtown Nashville and really was the first major corporation downtown. And we see the development here in Nashville now, the uh, uh, Fifth and Broadway, Alliance Bernstein and Amazon and Oracle's coming. So, um, you know, you, you can't say uh, definitively that cause and effect Bridgestone coming and building a, a beautiful building down on Demunbrian and Forth uh, led to that development, but clearly they, uh, they were a pathfinder 
of big corporations coming to the downtown area? Well, one of the good things about Tennessee and particularly Nashville is you have such a diversity of economic base. I mean, the manufacturing, the headquarters, um, the um, financial, the banks, um, the country music, that recording stuff and the printing that goes along with all that. There's a, there's a very diverse climate in Nashville. And uh, I think the Japanese company certainly attracted a, a lot of attention to it. I mean, Bridgestone moving to Tennessee is not just going to tell other Japanese companies it's a good place. They're telling the whole world. I mean, there are people that probably do not know that Bridgestone is really Ishibashi in Japan. I mean, Stone Bridge. I mean, there are probably people that don't even know that. And Bridgestone is such a wonderful example of, it was the second biggest company in Tennessee behind Nissan. But Bridgestone, and particularly under uh, Chris, uh, you were talked about Chris the other day, she was so she was so forthcoming in diversity in communications and publications and support across the whole community. I mean, uh, they didn't blink any eyes right. with doing the right thing. And so, you know, I think not only did we attract Japanese companies, but we attracted good. Japanese companies. I mean, those that really were concerned about their corporate image, Nissan, Bridgestone, Toshiba, um, uh, Denso in East Tennessee, his, uh, the, uh, the companies there in Shelbyville, and I can't even call their names, uh, Calsonic, have the Calsonic Arena. You know, they built a whole horse arena for the walking horse capital of Tennessee, you know, so they're really being local, but at the same time, high profile, and um, it just creates a, a, a good image. Um, they've done the same in Bartlett, and I was trying to think of, uh, what was the Bartlett? The printing, Brother, Brother Industries. Brother Industries has done incredible stuff in Bartlett. And then with all these Japanese companies, you know, you talk about the, uh, we had mentioned the Southeast U.S. Japan Association, and we had it in Memphis in 96, and Arnold Pearl was the, the, the kind of like the functioning chairman, but the honorary chairman was um, FedEx. What's his name? Oh, gosh, I've forgotten his name. Anyway, he, uh, he had Sandy Dickey doing all the work. Mr. But, Smith. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, had Sandy Dickey, who's a wonderful person, doing all the work there. But when you've got FedEx behind you sponsoring something, people want to be associated with it. And you had, you know, Sharp Corporation there in Memphis. You had Mitsui. You had Brother. You had people all over the state of Tennessee, the Japanese companies supported the Memphis meeting in, in terms of, of lending their dollars to it. Even though they weren't in that community, they realized the benefit of, uh, they were going to be exposed to governors and delegations from seven, uh, six other states, including the state of Tennessee. So I don't know. And it was a good economic time too, 96 was a good time to raise money. <laughs> right, right. Well, you know, uh, a lot of these companies, um, obviously a, a name like Nissan, people understand it's a Japanese company, but there were probably many people uh, who don't know that Bridgestone is a Japanese owned uh, company. Mm -hmm. And I didn't sure. know that that Calsonic was, uh, you know, I've been I've been down to Shelbyville and I, I've been to the, uh, the uh, uh, the walking horse, uh, what's the, the name of the uh, annual? Uh, right, the walking uh, horse, whatever. Yeah, the celebration, yeah. And uh, I've been in the Calsonic Arena and I had no clue it was a Japanese company. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, 
Kamatsu in Chattanooga. And, you know, Kamatsu in Chattanooga gave, what, 30% of the seed money for, you know, for the, the uh, aquarium and the downtown development. Yeah. Joining the Coca-Cola people, the people that don't, they didn't uh, have the recipe for Coca-Cola, but they have the rights to distribution for all Coca-Cola all over the world. Now, they, they probably don't need a Christmas basket from us, but, you know, I mean, you realize what wealth there is in these communities and how those people want to be part of the community. And I think the Japanese company Komatsu saw that and uh, has been a wonderful part of that community. Do you have any other examples around the state where Japanese companies have done uh, things for the community like the Calsonic Arena and the uh, the aquarium and you know we've got the Bridgestone Arena here in Nashville and and I know Bridgestone and, and Nissan have foundations that provide the grants to nonprofits around the state. Well and in Denso in Maryville, Tennessee um, they put a lot of, of money into the community into education and as well as being they're very supportive and have been a big part of the, uh, the Japan America Society of Tennessee, which helps um, provide grants for riders and, and stipends for kids going to school. Um, uh, uh, you know, I've been away from it so long, it's hard for me to know what exactly is going on now, but those are the right. ones that come to mind immediately. Um, Mitsui Corporation has, um, is one of the largest trading companies in the world. And uh, I was lucky enough to have lunch one day at the Mitsui Club in, in Japan. And they have a big scholarship program, big scholarship program that they work through the Japan America Society to, to administer. So, uh, they're very, Japanese are very culturally aware. You know, it was, uh, I was, I heard a lot when the Japanese companies first came over here about, you know, if, if the wife is happy, the executive will be happy. And that was real important. And she's not going to be happy if her kids don't aren't keeping up with kids back in Japan. So one of the first jobs with the Japan Center in Tennessee was to help establish Saturday schools. See, and this doesn't have anything to do with the investment, but at the same time, it has a lot to do with the investment, you know, and they established Saturday schools in Knoxville, uh, Murfreesboro and Memphis uh, out east in Memphis. And, and now they've established even more, I believe. But that structure that started out with only a few and in, in local communities giving their, uh, driving the, the school buses on Saturday, getting volunteers to drive the school buses to pick up the kids, take them to the Saturday school so they could keep up with the Japanese side of their education in case they had to go back to Japan. I mean, those are little bitty things that people don't hear so much about, but it goes a long way uh, when it's it, like I, we, we were talking earlier, the Japanese, after the first couple of Japanese companies I, I was working with, I realized that there were always going to be the same questions. And if you look at what those questions were, those, those are the things that were really important to them. And so we slowly took those questions and started trying to figure out ways to bring resources to make those things possible. And uh, yeah, I think it's one of the most rewarding things the state of Tennessee has done, um, investing in the cultural uh, aspects of a foreign country investing in the state of Tennessee. Was there any, uh, uh connection between those sorts of cultural things and local communities? Do you know of any cases where Japanese culture might be uh, provided? I know the JAST uh, uh, events all year round around the state. They just did a festival in Memphis. Uh, yeah, um, 
the Cherry Blossom Festival is wonderful. And I actually worked that a couple of times and, and wore my little yukata. Lee dressed me up in a yukata and I bowed to people as they came in. Um, yeah, there's all sorts of, you know, I think the world we live in is becoming more and more aware of the differences uh, in cultures. But in actually, as you as you look at the cultural differences, you find the similarities. It's the same thing. I mean, people want a safe place for their children to live. They want them to be well educated and they want them to do well in life. You know, that's not different in any, any culture. Um, there may be political things that come into play to keep that from happening, but um, you know, we're very fortunate in the United States that, that we have the ability to, to provide that. Yeah. Um, John, we're, uh, we're closing, uh, closing in on time here. So let me just ask uh, another couple of questions. One is, uh, I, I just want to circle back to the impact of Japanese business in Tennessee and, and put kind of an exclamation point on it. And you've said that the edict there at the Tennessee Economic and Community Development Department was to uh, attract manufacturing investments to create good jobs for Tennesseans. So right. uh, looking at the, your experience over those years and what you've seen since, how would you uh, grade the, uh, the result in bringing Japanese companies that provided good jobs for Tennesseans? Well, I, th I think we've been very lucky that we've had people in positions of uh, management, even in the background, who have uh, have seen the long have seen the long term benefits of attracting industry, and not only seen it, but helped to pass it on, even though it went to a different political administration. I mean. One person in particular, uh, Tom Benson, who was Commissioner of Economic Development under Ray Blanton, who I was hired under in, in 1977, uh, Commissioner Benson was the one that helped form the Southeast U.S. Japan, the Japan Southeast U.S. Associations, those meetings that go back and forth between the companies. And he was the one that actually signed the charter for that. Um, I don't think Ray Blanton ever went to one of those meetings, but when Ray Blanton left office and Lamar Alexander came in, uh, Tom Benson had long talks with Lamar and his people, even though they were different political parties. But, you know, back then we weren't that different, you know, and it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't as divisive as it has become of late. But, you know, Tom actually put time in with making suggestions about what Lamar might do. And I think Lamar had enough um, political savvy to realize that, you know, Tom was telling him the truth. And then that coupled with the fact that the Nissan uh, came in sh shortly after Lamar was put into office it kind of helped cement what he was going to do for the next eight years. And that, luckily, McWhorter, again, a different party, you know, Alexander's a Republican, McWhorter's a Democrat, but McWhorter coming in and realizing that it didn't matter what party you were in, it just made sense right. to continue something that was paying off in jobs, investments, and taxes. So, you know, you would think, I have a saying down in South Florida, if common sense is so common, why does no one down here have it? But, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, there was a time, truly, when I could see people that were running for office having common sense and realizing they could call it their program, nobody cared, as long as they continued to do something that was beneficial. And uh, I think those people did. And then they was followed by uh, Don Sundquist and uh, Governor Bredesen uh, kind of, you know, Governor Bredesen was so far out of my league and as far as his thinking process, he was into, you know, all sorts of other things, but it was always about the jobs in Tennesseans and improving the quality of life, so. 
And as a result, somewhere in uh, the Tennessee Economic and Community Development Department, there's a, a desk with a dusty drawer with a map in it that shows uh, Tennessee with uh, this and that plant uh, here and there. I will, you know, I'd like to find that. See, I gave all, I had a box of, oh, I gave a lot of stuff to Lee and Lee Wyland, who you've talked to, and she, um, she, she went ahead and passed it on to the people that were supposed to be interested in keeping it. And I'm not sure that they, they, they were, but um, I'm thinking the state of Tennessee probably has a record of that because I've had it printed so many times and there's I, supposed I just, to be a record. I so. suspect they have, they have a new, uh, new map updated with uh, the latest deals. You know, I don't know. Is anybody still doing it? You know, I, I, I think one thing we lose track of is it, you know, God so loved, loved the world, he didn't send a committee. And um, it takes like one person really doing it. You know, we had to have one right. person. Do it. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if that person exists anymore. I think they have general ideas. And maybe it's not so important. Now. Maybe we're so far past all that that you know, the, 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 the particulars are not quite as important as they were, but I could certainly see the progression from when I came in with, you know, six, seven, eight companies up to almost 170 with billions of investment. I mean, you could, I'm glad I was there then. I'm glad I was there then. Now we have a, a, a consulate in uh, Nashville, the only uh, international consulate in the state and it's the consulate of Japan. Do you have any thoughts right. on the, the, the significance of that move? Well, yeah. I mean, he was in New Orleans and they moved to, he moved to uh, Tennessee. Um, there was a lot, there was more business coming to Tennessee. They were having a lot more, uh, their business as a consulate was becoming more and more busy with people from Tennessee. You know, Tennessee was part of the consulate of New Orleans because we were on the Mississippi River back when those things were drawn and the quickest way would be right up the Mississippi. I mean, this, anyway. Right. It's interesting how things are, are, are divided off. Um, but it but, but it does but, reflect the uh, the impact of yeah. Japanese business in the state exactly. of Tennessee. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, because he they more they had many more people in Tennessee to deal with than they did in New Orleans and Louisiana. Now, now let me ask you about the Japan American Society of Tennessee JAST. Uh, you were probably around when it started. It got off its feet. Uh, can you give uh, just a couple of comments about uh, what it does and its evolution? Yeah, we kind of, um, we, it, it evolved out of the 1996 meeting in Memphis. And one of the things that the governor at the time was, prom Sunquist was promising was to uh, reinstate the J Japan America Society of Tennessee and becoming that designation. That's a national designation. We were the Japan Society of Tennessee at one point and now it's the Japan America Society of Tennessee. So you have to jump through certain hoops to do that and also become a 501c3. So that was actually done and accomplished shortly after the 96 meeting and uh, Arnold Pearl uh, who was a big participant in that meeting, particularly with the fundraising. Uh, he was a, he was driving uh, that effort all the way. And uh, so that happened shortly after that meeting. And then from there, it's been through, I hired the first person in that job. And then the second person in the job was um, uh, Lee Wyland, who I'd worked for with for years. And so she and I worked well together. And I was, I was there a lot driving with her all over the state, trying to uh, kick up interest in, in getting people signed up to support that uh, association. So now it's become kind of its own entity with a fairly good sized budget. And, and 
doing good things. The but, Festival of Memphis yes. and the cherry blossoms and, and this well, project and, to uh, and talk to you. Educational things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, there was a point when I thought about it, when I retired, I thought about Lee was saying, well, when do you want to take over? And I, <laughs> anyway, it, it, it was becoming the big, busiest part-time job in history. And Lee was so phenomenal at it. You know, Lee was willing to give, uh, I suspect Lee of being a vampire of some sort because she works all night long and she likes to rest during the day. So. But she she's done such a phenomenal job with tapping resources and bringing people together and matching and that sort of stuff. What Great. Joe Pauling is. Well, John, and, thank you so much for uh, for your time today. We uh, really appreciate your reflections on how the uh, business grew. Uh, you were there at the start and um, gave us some great insights and perspectives. We've been talking with John Gregory. He uh, retired in 2006 as the Director of Asian Development at the Tennessee Department of Economic and Community Development. He served there from 1977 to 2006. And he's been kind enough to talk to us today about the, uh, the initial uh, Japanese corporations coming to Tennessee, the impact they have on communities, uh, in bringing jobs and, uh, and other resources to Tennessee. And John, uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Appreciate it. Enjoyed it.